evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, a special summer lecture. Uh, this year, the Society was unable to put on a science festival lecture as we normally do. Uh, and indeed, the entire Glasgow Science Festival was cancelled uh, due to the pandemic. But today we've got a lecture that will hopefully fill some of that science gap in our programme and maybe with some distillery oriented diversions along the way. It's not currently possible for us to assemble en masse in the lecture theatre and we expect this situation to continue at least until the end of the year. This is the first time the Society has attempted a virtual lecture, so do please forgive any gremlins that may appear. Before the questions, of course, we have the lecture and our speaker tonight is Mr. David Webster. He's an accomplished speaker who has recently presented to the Geological Society of Glasgow using Zoom, so uh, hopefully knows what he's doing. David Webster has a degree in geology from Oxford University, an MSc from Stockholm, and he's worked for many years in the oil industry. He's now actively retired and has built a house on Isla and is co-author of A Guide to the Geology of Isla. Please feel free to pour yourself a wee dram of your favourite Isla whiskey while you enjoy tonight's lecture as David takes us on a guided excursion around the geology of Isla. So David, if I could please ask you to share your screen and unmute your microphone, the floor is all yours. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, right. Well, welcome to Isla. Um, we're going to do a quick tour of the of Isla. Um, and we're going to throw a bit of history and archaeology into the mix, just to sort of show how geology relates to all these other disciplines. And we'll have a bit of whiskey as well. Um, there's a story between link between geology and whiskey, which I've uh, really enjoyed exploring and researching. So we'll have a look at that as we go along the uh, along. So I think guess everybody knows where Isla is. Southern Hebrides, nearest island of Scotland to Ireland. You can see Ireland quite well from Isla. You get to it on the ferry from Kennecraig, and you can actually get there from Oban as well. So, uh, yeah, it's actually south of Glasgow, believe it or not. People think it's uh, north, but it's not. It's actually south. So we're going to tour a wee bit of Isla. You have to start with the geological map. Uh, everyone likes geological maps because they're beautifully coloured. Uh, geologists always talk about rocks in age order. So the old, when you see a column at the side of a geological map, hopefully it's an age order oldest at the bottom. We always start our stories at the beginning and um, off we go at looking at all the different rock colours in, in the geology of Isla. The oldest rocks in Isla are in the, uh, the west and the youngest rocks are in the southeast, which pretty much mirrors Scotland and pretty much mirrors the UK. The oldest rocks in the UK are in the Lewis, in Harris and Lewis and the youngest rocks are in London. Isla is like a miniature version of that. So it's oldest over here and the youngest over here. But it's all relative because these rocks here, the oldest rocks are about, and I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute, are about 1.8 billion years. Now the earth is 4.7 billion years. So these are quite old, relative, but still half the age of the earth, a bit less than half the age of the earth. And the rest of the Isla is round about 600 million years, between 800 and 600. So we're talking about the Precambrian. Those of you who understand a bit about uh, the sort of periods of the Earth, this is Precambrian before the mage, major uh, burst of life at the Cambrian. So these are all older rocks than 540, which is the beginning of the Cambrian. Um, these are pre late Precambrian. These are sort of quite early in the Precambrian. So we're looking at some rocks here. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide because I wanted to show you the old maps. These are the old sort of uh, late Victorian uh, surveyors. Basically, the whole team of the British Geological Survey surveyed the whole of the British Isles and including a lot of Scotland, obviously, at the time. And these guys are just well known. These are these are our heroes, uh, Charles Clough, Ben Peach. And they did a very, with all their colleagues in the British Geological Survey, produced this wonderful map um, in the, in the, uh, very, very early part of the 20th century. And it is still a good map. There is, they were observational scientists. They observed the natural landscapes. They were interested in describing things. And they just drew a beautiful map of, of Isla and Jura and the rest of Scotland. You can see the detail in this when you get into it. It's beautiful. So this is a, this is a nice map. Uh, I wanted to mention this guy as well. This guy uh, Battersby Bailey is famous for, he did a sort of revised version of the map and brought it up to date for 1916. 
he was an eccentric character. This guy, uh, Matt Dyler, uh, in short, he thought that long trousers would get too wet. He cut off the toes of his shoes so that he wouldn't get wet feet. He tied everything to his body and his jacket with string and ate his lunch before he left his accommodation so he wouldn't have to carry it. And he did a fantastic resurvey of the map, but it didn't change it vastly, but he got the sort of structure, the structural details of the, of the geology dead on. And this map and his work still stand stead today. Uh, so we have a great uh, regard for, for Battersby Bailey's uh, work in the, in, the, in the very early part of the 20th century. Time, we have to talk geological time. I did mention about 1.8 billion years ago, and uh, we're gonna talk about the early rocks of, the, of what you see on Isla, uh, around about 1.8 billion years. Then there's a big gap, we call it the billion year gap before we actually get a lot of sedimentation that we're gonna see that's around about the 600, 700, 800 million year, the late Precambrian, which is most of Isla. Then lots of wee, th wee things happened right through the rest of the geological time up to the present sort of ice age that we're still in at the moment. So we're gonna focus a bit on the Rins complex. We're gonna have a look at this Rins complex at the bottom of the, uh, of the column here. We're gonna have a wee look at uh, this stuff here and have a quick look at the end about some of the, uh, the stuff that happened uh, later on in geological time. So three key periods of time we're going to sort of investigate in three key areas of, of Isla. So here's a sort of uh, Google Earth map of Isla and we're gonna, head off to Brooklady, which is where I've got my house. I live over just here. Um, so this is a bit I know quite well. This is the Rins Peninsula. People who know Isla would know this is the Rins. It's almost an island. There's a sort of neck of land, of low land here. This bit of the western side of Isla is the Rins. The rest of it is the mainland bit. The towns of Beaumont, Port Ellen, and here in Port Askeg over here. Brooklady is a wee, uh, wee village dominated by a distillery. My house is up on the hill behind there. Um, and a very pleasant place to start your geological tour of, of Isla by uh, driving along here, the wee shop, and you can stop here and look at rocks. So, um, oh, I thought I'd go another rock. Anyway, so we've moved on to Portner Haven. I'm gonna just, I, I've got a picture of a rock in a minute. It's coming up. There it is. Yes, sorry. This is, should have come after the Brookladdy slide because at Brookladdy and at Portner Haven, you see two key rocks in the Rins complex, a pink rock, and a sort of greeny black uh, rock. And these are the common rocks that we see on Isla in this part of the Rins complex. And uh, if you go to any beach, you will find these red pebbles and these greenish sort of blackish pebbles. And they belong to these two rocks. 70% of this Rins complex is made of this. And it's a nice, uh, uh, nice, uh, and it's a sort of uh, once was a sort of granite, a quartz poor granite called a cyanite. And it's, been, and it's got this sort of crude banding in it. It's been uh, metamorphosed and changed, but it was originally an igneous molten rock uh, called a, cy a cyanite. And it's now being nice, ni a nice, a cyanitic nice. I'll explain a little more about that in a minute. And the other rock is a greenish rock that here. It used to be a basalt or a dolerite, um, and it's now been metamorphosed. And it's now a meta dolerite or a meta basite. And it's sort of, so you get these red rocks, pinky red rocks and these sort of greeny brown, greeny black rocks. And I like to sort of think of them as sort of like, like green apples and red apples. But they're very, very common, these pebbles. And this is the predominant rocks in the Rins complex are these two rock types. Um, we're going to move on. I meant to show you some at Portland Haven, but I've just, in terms of time, I'm going to just move on to Lossett Bay, where the, this Rins complex is, is, is well exposed. And this is Lossett Bay. It's one of my favorite, favorite places on Isla. It's a beautiful bay on the west coast, and we're going to have a quick look at some of the rocks that you see down on the uh, on the south uh, side of the bay here. And it's called the Rins Complex for a very good reason, because these rocks are complicated. There are lots of rock types. When I said it was simple, and there was just a pink one and a sort of greeny black one, well, there's the greeny black one, and that's the greeny black one. There's the pink one, um, but there's a black one over here, a different black one, a different black one here. There's a fold in here. There's all sorts of pink, other pinky rocks here, black rocks here. And it's a bit of a mess. It's not nicely layered. It's not uh, structured very, very difficult to sort of work out what's going on. And these are a whole bunch of rocks that have been, were once all igneous rocks. They were all molten rocks uh, at one stage in their lives. And they've been chewed up and messed about and recrystallized and partially melted and all turned into different things. So they're igneous rocks that have been metamorphosed. So we call them meta-igneous rocks. And where did they form? 
well, this is a classic sort of uh, diagram that I drew, I stuck in the book, which was to do just to sort of illustrate the main principles of plate tectonics, uh, with mid ocean ridges uh, creating oceanic crust, which is being destroyed in trenches. It, uh, the, the wet, cold slab going down causes partial melting of the Earth's mantle. Uh, magma rises up and volcanoes appear in volcanic arcs or on continental crust, they'll appear like the Andes or Japan. We believe that the Rins complex was formed at this sort of area here in the Earth's crust, probably 30 or 40 kilometers down in the Earth's crust underneath an active volcanic arc, um, which was forming at that time. So 1.8 billion years ago, Isla the bits of Isla we see today were formed in a, in a volcanic arc uh, formed on the edge of a continent. Now, this continent 1.8 billion years ago was called Columbia. Some of the literature calls it Nuna. It seems to be interchangeable depending on which uh, field and, and school you belong to. Here's a map of Columbia and it's got the existing bits of Scotland, this is NS is Northern Scotland. So Northern Scotland existed. This is the, this is the Northern Highlands of Scotland and Lewis and Harris. They existed 1.8 billion years ago and were a continent. This is the Baltic Shield. This is the core of uh, the Baltic area. This is Northern Rockall. This is Greenland. And this would be the edge of the continent. So imagine this is almost like the edge of Asia and this is Japan as a sort of a volcanic arc uh, sitting at Isla is the star. And these are volcanoes, this, these black dots here, and this is a trench here, a uh, an oceanic trench destroying the oceanic crust. And this, this was where the, the Rins rocks were formed 1.8 billion years ago. And we've called it the Malin Arc, because it, but, it, but the rocks stretch all the way from Greenland to Sweden. About 1.7 billion years ago, i.e. not long after, but 100 million years later, that arc had crashed into Colombia and we call it an accretion uh, complex because it's like added on to Columbia. Continents grow through plate tectonics, they grow and accrete. So when the, we're getting more and more continental crust growing all the time as, as plate tectonics continues to uh, evolve the Earth's crust and create more, uh, um, less dense continental crust out of the oceanic crust. Um, we get these things happening all the time. But Isle is here, and this is the southern part of Scotland here. This is the, the Grampian terrain here, which, which has been moved by strike slip faulting and joined up with this subsequently. But at that time, it would have been well south of northern Scotland. The southern part of Rockall, the drilling and the dredging samples on Rockall show that there's the same rocks. Southern Greenland has the same rocks, and southern Sweden and Norway have the same rocks. So this whole band of rock that we see on Isla actually has a lot of affinities with Greenland, Rockall, and, um, and, and Sweden. And we think his Isla here, right in the middle of this belt of rock here, the Dalradian rocks, which we're going to see in a minute. And it's the basement, it's the basement, or what geologists call, often call the basement. It's the, the oldest rocks you see that all the younger rocks are sitting on. And the basement underneath the whole of Northern Ireland, uh, the whole of Donegal, Northern Mayo, uh, right up through Isla, Argyll, right through the Grampians, right through the Cairngorms, right up to Peterhead. If you drilled a hole anywhere in this area down deep enough, you would hit the Rins complex. It's underneath all of this area. Yeah? Different rocks over here, the Great Glen Fault and the Highland Boundary Fault are major terrain boundaries. They're big geological boundaries between different chunks of rock. That accreted arc went all the way along here, and then you could follow it out to rock all that way in Greenland, and you can follow it this way into Sweden. So this is the, a little window. It's the only exposure we have. We've got a little tiny rock, rock outcrop here, just off uh, Donegal. Uh, in Ishtrul, and pretty much that's it. There's a few bits over here, but they're a bit changed uh, in, the, in, the, in the, over here um, in, in, the, in Mayo. But basically, we don't see these rocks, but only on Isla. So it's a unique opportunity to see some really old rocks and the flooring at the floor of part of Scotland. Before I leave here, my first whiskey uh, exploit here. This is a, a whiskey story because this is the one of the few bottles of whiskey I know of, perhaps the only one there is, with a geological map on it. Uh, Brookladdy produced this whiskey in 2007 from a 1980 barrel um, and they put this geological map on it. Um, the reason, and they called this, this particular expression the mayor of Isla because the Isla is a place in Peru and they invited the mayor of Isla in Peru to come to Brookladdy to taste this whiskey and meet, meet him here. 
because at that time they thought that the rocks of Isla, the Rins complex, was very similar to rocks in Isla in Peru. In fact, here is a picture of Isla in Peru. It's got a nice on the coast, um, has pink rocks and dark rocks, very similar rocks. Um, this is their badge. Um, this is uh, this is where it is in in Peru. So the mayor of Isla came to came to Isla um, to sample his uh, eponymous whiskey. And here's the map that's on the bottle. Yeah, and it sort of uh, basically tried to illustrate the fact that at that time they thought that northern Scotland and Peru or that part of Gondwana in South America were joined up and Baltica was over here. We now believe that to be erroneous and that Baltica is actually, we are facing Baltica at the time because it's part, the geology is much more like this than that. Although there are rocks of the same age as the Rins in Peru, they're not actually joined up. And there's a spring of water that comes out of these rocks that, 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 that the, the distillers use uh, to sort of dilute their whiskey from cast strength to bottling strength and it comes bubbling out of the rocks on the Rins complex so the, the 200 the two 1.8 billion year old rock is producing a, a very weird spring uh, that the local farmer is ex as, as uh, pumping out which supplies all the water for port Ch for the uh, all the water at Brookladdy for their uh, cutting whiskey cutting water for the whiskey uh, from cast strength to bottling strength and it's also all the water this special water is all the water used in the botanist gin, those of you who've sampled their wonderful gin. We've sampled this water geologically or chemically, and we real, what we've realized is this water, although it's quite soft, it's still below pH of seven, it's under pH of six. It's a little bit higher than the rest of the Isla waters, which are very soft, about a little bit, little bit harder than Glasgow tap water in terms of its pH, but it's got a very high silica content. And this is a strange water to get because all the river water, all the burns, everything in there comes off the rain and it's got this, uh, it'll be just like this. These waters here, the waters you get in the, in the main distilleries. Brugladi's own bottling uh, process water is, uh, is very soft uh, and contains quite low silica and low uh, alkalis as well. But the Octomore Spring is unusual. And we reckon it's because it lies on a fault pattern and the faults cutting right through this Rins complex. And I think well, here's a picture of the faults there. Yeah? All these faults seem to sort of focus on this where this strange spring is. The spring is, as you saw in that previous picture or the earlier picture, it was next to the burn. Now the burn's got pretty much rainwater in it uh, with low silica and the spring has the high silica in it. And it's probably because it's percolating through all these uh, old crystalline rocks, which don't have a lot of carbonate in them, but they have a lot of silica in them. So uh, um, there's a geological reason why this water is different. Um, it's probably very old water, and Brookladdy make a nice uh, marketing ploy out of uh, this, and it makes nice whiskey. So um, it's a good story, a good geological story for your for your for your whiskey. Yeah, I mean this is just summarizes the geology of that area because there's the band of rocks from Greenland into Baltica where Isla is, and we think the, the Peru rocks are over here somewhere, um, quite a long way away at the time on the. 800 million years ago, we reckon that uh, that uh, Amazonia was over here and uh, the beginning of a split of this ancient continent called Rodinia, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. But uh, yeah, this is the rocks that line up, we think now, not the Peruvian rocks. But it's a good story. And and the, 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 the rock, the water from the spring is very different geologically to the rest of Isla's water. So we've... Uh, had a look at this. This is the Rins complex. Just sort of put it all in perspective. Uh, this is the these are the the gneisses and the the metabasite rocks, the, the pink and the green rocks here, and they're overlain, <coughs> excuse me, by a whole series of rocks belonging to what's called the Dalradian, which is a whole group of rocks, uh, maybe twenty or so kilometers thick in total, uh, deposited over a two hundred million year time frame on the edge of this Rodinia continent that was splitting up. So Rodinia was the supercontinent that existed at a thousand million years ago. Remember, Columbia was the supercontinent that existed two billion years ago. We've got uh, this new supercontinent, Rodinia, which is breaking up, and, and a whole load of rocks are formed on the edge of it, um, which is called the Dalradian. It's, and the Dalradian rocks do cover the pretty much Scotland from Isla up to Peterhead. And they sit on top of this Rins complex, which, as I've just said, only occurs on Isla, only exists on Isla. As exposure but it's underneath everything and all these sort of rocks are, exist uh, along strike along the, in Scotland. Uh, 
So we're gonna have a quick look at this one here, and then we'll move up to look at these and these at, at the top. So I just wanted to take you to Kilkeran Bay. We were down at Lossett Bay earlier, and Brookladdy was over here, and Port Charlotte was here, and that spring was here. And we're just on the, the coast on the far west of Isla at Kilkeran Bay. And here's a sort of uh, badly made uh, uh, panorama of Kilkeran Bay. And we've got here uh, these what were called meta sediments. So these are meta sandstones, sandstones that were once uh, sand, and then they became sandstone, and they'd be metamorphosed to um, to become uh, quartzites and meta sandstones, and then we've got mudstones in here, which are slates, and then we've got more sandstones over here. And there, this is the pink rock here. It's a bit dirty, and when you look at it, you can't see that, but when you get there, it's pink. This is the pink rock. This is two billion years old, 1.8 billion years old pink gneiss, and over here is 800 million year old quartzites. So there's a billion years of geology missing or time missing in this billion year gap. And this is Alistair from Stockholm standing, straddling the billion year gap. And you can walk on a low tide, you can walk into this and sort of put your hands either side of the gap where there's a billion years of Earth's history sort of missing between the, the this is quite called the Kilkiran shear zone. In fact, your picture was of, the, of, the, of, of it here. You can see that all on the, on the Earth satellite photograph here, these rocks here are the gneisses. And these rocks here with a lot more structure and foliate lineation here are the meta sandstones of the Collinsey group. And that picture was taken in here. Um, and the shear zone is offset by this fault here. But this Kilkiran shear zone is a very prominent feature separating the 2 billion or the 1.8 billion year old rocks of the gneiss here from the meta sediments on this side. And that, uh, that line is quite prominent. It's a lovely walk down the coast here, and all these uh, little tidal inlets and tidal bays where the shear zone runs through here. Because it's a shear zone, it erodes out from the harder rocks of the, of the quartzites here and the pink gneisses here. There's a sort of zone of erosion along the coast here, and it's a lovely place to go. Um, further north, the, these rocks turn into, uh, above, slightly above these rocks of the of Kilkiran Bay, we get these what are called turbidites. These are uh, Collinsy group turbidites where they're deposited in very deep water um, with finding up cycles of sand to mud and sand to mud deposited probably during earthquake times. So there's a whole lovely succession of rocks at, at, from Kilkiran to Saligo which form the Collinsy group which go to Collinsy as well and they're all around about 800 million years ago and they're the first deposits uh, formed as Rodinia broke up. So that's the map I showed you earlier. Um, there's Isla in this sort of growing split. You know, the split is starting, at the, um, a bit like the Red Sea today. Um, the Red Sea is splitting uh, Arabia from Africa and, the, and breaking up the African Asian continent. And this split started to break up the Rodinia supercontinent. And uh, this, this happened and got bigger and bigger as the Dalradian sequence was deposited. We got it was in a small rift and it got into a wider rift and eventually became an ocean basin that separated uh, Laurentia, which is sort of basically North America, Scotland, Greenland, from Baltica. Um, so we finished over here, um, just checking how we're doing for time. Um, yeah, we're, we're okay, yep. Um, so we've, we've been here, we've been here, we've been here, we've looked at the Collinsy group, which is the green stuff, we've looked at the Rins complex, which is that. I'm now gonna take you over to the sort of, uh, sort of uh, central part of Isla, to a place called Bally Grant um, here and we're going to look at some deposits of rocks in this area and up in here and at the end of the talk we're going to end up down in here but we're going to start at Bally Grant which is right in the middle of the, uh, the map here and the the rocks we're going to look at are rocks in the middle of the succession yeah are around about 700 million years old um, basically we're going to look at these three types of rock here the Lossett limestone the Port Eskig Teal and the Bonnerhaven Dolomite these limestones are like a sandwich of rocks that, in, that, that are limestone carbonate type rocks. Uh, dolomite is a magnesium calcium carbonate, whereas limestone is a calcium carbonate. And it's got this thing called the Port Askeg Tillite in the middle, which is a glacial deposit. So we've got warm water limestones sandwiching a cold glacial deposit. And this is the, the, uh, the alleged snowball earth signature on Isla. So I'll have a quick look at this. Bally Grant's a lovely wee little place. Um, it means Bally Grana, which is Grana. I can't get the Gaelic right, but it means it was the town of the grain originally. Um, Bally Grant is in the middle of Isla, and it was uh, 
it was well known for its uh, uh, fields of wheat and barley and oats uh, uh, in the in the past. And you can see that when you look at the at Google Earth maps, you can actually see this is the fertile strip of Isla. Yeah, all these green blobs here are fields that are fertile because there's limestone in it, and that's the key to sort of the fertility of Ireland, of Isla. And it's why it became an important part in, if you go to Finlagen to the, to the Lord of the Isles sort of a, uh, uh, historical center here, Isla was important because it was the production of grain. It did have fertile land, relatively well sheltered, and uh, Valley Grant was at the sort of core of this area. Um, and so it was a, a lot of these fields uh, grew grain in latter years, it was turned to dairy. Dairy is gone now, it's sheep and cattle. And in the last few years, uh, it's returned to grain. Not because we want oats and barley, and we oats for porridge, we want barley for whiskey. And the, uh, these fields, you can see these plowed fields now have turned from sheep fields uh, to barley fields. And there's a lot of barley now grown uh, in the central strip of Isla for whiskey. But what Valley Grant was famous for in the sort of, uh, from the sort of 14th century on was lead mining. Uh, at Mulreach, just underneath on the island, these are the perhaps the Jura in the background, there's a, some big lead mines that were operating in the 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, they were looking for galena, lead sulfide, there's this cubic sort of uh, metallic sort of ore. There's quite a lot of it there. Um, it was all hand dug, mainly. Um, there was a smelter at, 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 at Port Askeg, um, in the seventh, in the eighteenth century, here um, these are sort of old engravings of that. Um, so it was smelted on the island and exported. The lead was exported, and there was a byproduct of the lead mining was silver. And um, at Valley Grant at the quarry there now, there's a uh, the Gartness mine was famous for the sort of byproduct. It was actually more mined for the silver in it than the gold. And this is a goblet that's actually in the um, Kelvin Grove collection, and it says on its little label, Isla Silver. And it's uh, made about 1780, so it, there's silver on Isla, or well, there has been. The, the mul mines at Mulrish are still available. You can go and have a pot around these things. If you're into, into, into art, industrial archaeology, there's a, a washing pool pond, there's big drainage adits, there's shafts and ladder shafts. There's, um, and a lot of uh, miners were imported or immigrated. Immigrants came from Wales and from Cornwall to, to, to work the mines. And there still are Edwards and Griffiths uh, on the island that are descendants of these original, uh, some of these uh, Welsh miners that came to help uh, exploit the lead. Came and went, it was a move and bust economy um, and there were sort of all sorts of uh, uh, boom times and, poor and bad times. And I've managed to pull together from all the records and um, the sort of amount of lead that was produced uh, in a sort of each 25 year period from the historical record. Now there's not much before the sort of 16th century, but uh, there were certainly, you can see there were periods in the history records when mining investments were made and then it all tailed off and more investments were made and it tailed off. In fact, there was very little, very little, no more lead was mined after about 1880 on Isla. The geological connection is that the, what, because there was lots of talk in the in the historical record about whether the Vikings way back before this and even in this part of the before the historical records whether there had been any lead mining prior to the 15th, 16th century, and uh, an enterprising PhD student in Edinburgh uh, did some work on uh, on uh, sediments in the various locks that these mines drained into to try and see whether there was any sign of lead pollution. Um, and integrate the lead, lead record in the peak cores to the pollen records and to other dating things so we can actually try and date any uh, geochemical anomalies in the record. And this is what he found in the various locks and, and tried to match the, the, the geochemical anomalies with the, um, with, the mining, uh, with the mining records. And there's a crude collect connection here, but the lock loss it seems to have uh, evidence of mining that's before any historical record around about the beginning of the 15th century. So there's, um, there's sort of a, a nice tie-in between history, archaeological archeo history of um, industrial archaeology history and sort of uh, modern geological techniques to try and to try and tie the whole story together. Uh, they didn't find anything a lot it was any earlier than this so we, we, we're still not convinced that the, the Vikings mined Lead on Isla. We know the Vikings are on Isla, but every settlement township has got a, uh, a Viking name. But uh, we don't think they 
were into the lead. Nowadays, Valley Grant has a huge quarry. The limestone is well used on Isla for roadstone. Um, every track on Isla has a Valley Grant limestone. Um, it's quite a big operation from Dunlosset Estate to quarry this limestone out in Valley Grant. And the mine, one of the mines, the silver mine, actually cuts right through here. So I've had to scrap around in here trying to find some silver, but I haven't found any yet. Anyway, uh, above the Valley Grant limestone, there's a Losset limestone, and it's got these things called stromatolites, which are sort of domal mounds of uh, algal material. So this is life in probably a fairly warm sea happening in and around, uh, in and around, uh, 700 million years ago and again the green fields are where the limestone is and then the sort of uh, the heathery hills in the distance are uh, sort of the quartzites and the, where the much poorer soil so the, the farming is all done on the limestone limestone on the limestone outcrop and it looks like this when you suddenly see it exposed it's sort of a gray limestone um, and it has these stromatolite domes in them it's just about 700 million years ago and it's overlain by the Port Askeg Tillite. Now, I could spend hours talking about the Port Askeg Tillite. In fact, it was on to my, one of my co-researchers here this morning, spent hours talking about the Port Askeg Tillite. There's a big story to be had, but I'm going to just skip over it very quickly. Port Askeg Tillite is a glacial deposit formed by the melting of ice, and, and it's a dump of all the stuff from clay to boulders that were deposited when the ice melted. And we believe there's about nearly a kilometer of this thickness of rock on island, which is quite unusual and it was uh, all deposited by melting ice. Uh, so each, there were glacial cycles that would bring this mud and stuff down and the ice would melt and then the, it would get reworked by the sea and then, it would, then another glacial pulse would come and we see lots and lots of glacial pulses uh, in the Port Askeg Tillite. And it's, uh, it was one of the first deposits ever recognized in the world that it was a rock, a fossil rock, an old rock that must have represented a glaciation that happened a long time ago. These guys didn't know how long ago it was. Uh, Dating, modern dating hasn't hadn't happened then, but uh, we now know this to be around about seven, just about 700 million years old. And we believe that rocks of this age around the world are typified by glacial deposits. So we've got glacial deposits of 700 million years old, just about on every continent. And the all the other evidence points to the fact that these were at sea level and at low latitude. So we're talking about something very strange going on. This was low latitude sea level glaciation. Now we have low latitude glaciation today, or certainly ice fields on Mount Kenya, Kilimanjaro on the equator, um, but they're at 5,000 meters. Uh, this is at sea level. So if we had ice today at sea level on the equator, we would be pretty worried about the climate and how the climate had changed. So this was what was happening. These were ice fields extending to sea level on the equator or near the equator. And it's obviously been termed snowball earth. Probably many of you have heard of this term. Um, when the, we believe, it's believed that the uh, earth completely froze over 700 million years ago and the deposits of the Port Askeg Tillet, one of the, one, one of the first uh, deposits in the world to be recognized to be part of this uh, phenomenon. Now, how the earth got into it and how the earth got out of it is a subject for another lecture, but nevertheless, uh, Isla is a, is a key point in, in the story of Snowball Earth. I've just shown another map, a different map, different, a different author of Rodinia at about that time. Um, and I think I'm going to click again. Scotland will appear. Yes, there we are. There's Scotland. On the, it's still on the edge of this uh, rift. It hasn't turned into an ocean yet. We're still in this rift. There's Laurentia, or that's North America, northern North America. There's Baltica. There's Amazonia, and it's Peru bit still over here. And we've got this ice field. All these, all these blue... Blue, sorry, blue. green dots are all uh, ice deposits around the world on every continent that's got them. Yeah, and we believe at that time all the world's, all the continents of the world were clustered on a in a single supercontinent, Rodinia, which is pretty much straddling the equator. Which meant that it does change the ocean circulation patterns quite a lot, and it maybe this is part of the reason why Snowball Earth happened because it was an accumulation of a supercontinent straddling the equator. I mean, it's quite possible that there was ice over here, but no ice at the poles. Um, we don't really know, but that's one of the, and the, I've mentioned, I've shown this thing called the flip, which is the Franklin Large Igneous Province. And it's possible that the combination of this uh, continent uh, over the equator at that time, along with a massive outpouring of volcanic rocks, was actually enough. The weathering of these rocks was enough to draw down the CO2 to cause massive cooling. And eventually, the amount of volcanic activity 
that then would, would then increase the CO2 and cause uh, global warming again. So th it may be a combination of this continental configuration and this igneous province being weathered, silicate weathering, and then uh, volcanic gases later on bring us out of snowball earth. So a lot of research is going on at the moment to this. There's papers every day get published on it. I've just skated over it very quickly, but uh, it's a nice story and there's a lot of, lot of uh, interest in this. I just want to take you up to the north of Isla very quickly because um, I mentioned the Port Aski, Tillite and the Losset Limestone, the Valley Grant, which is down in here. These are the limestones that underlie the sandwich of the Tillite. And I mentioned there was one on top. Um, this is called the Bonnerhaven Dolomite, which is sometimes called the Cap Carbonate. A lot of these Tillites and glacial deposits in the Precambrian around the world have a starter limestone. Then there's a, then there's a Tillite, geolog uh, diamic type uh, glacial deposits, and then it's followed by uh, dolomitic rocks or carbonate rocks afterwards. Um, it's a lovely place to go. This is the north coast of, uh, of Isla. Uh, this is Bain and Dodaris, um, beautiful bay, um, beautiful uh, raised beaches, beautiful cliff scenery. Um, in fact, these cliffs, these these uh, cliffs, cliffs, these caves here were were, were inhabited and lived in, uh, not just as, as not just as shielings. I think were all lived in all year round by by various farmers. These little fertile uh, raised beaches were, uh, were farmed. Um, a lot of goats live in here now, but it's, you, could, you could live in there still. Uh, they're big caves. They're raised up. They're now, uh, they were formed by the sea eight, nine, ten thousand years ago, um, but they're now the, the land has risen, the ice has and the sea has dropped, and they're now raised caves. But what we come to see on the north coast is the dolomite, and it's these huge mounds of algal material. Remember I showed you one earlier underneath the tillite, underneath the, um, that, but these are huge. There's uh, one of my, one of the co, one of the researchers, Ian Fairchild, standing there. You can see how big these things are. These are a couple of meters high and four or five meters across. And these are huge, great big mounds of algal material growing in the, uh, in the shallow warm seas above, after the glaciation had finished. Yeah. And they grew because Nothing else ate them. There, there were no grazing gastropods. There were no grazing things. So the, the algal domes were, were were life as we knew it at that time. Sometimes they they're quite they're relatively small, little isolated bumps. And this one here, this bed here, extends all the way around this 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 rock outcrop here, and it's draped by this layer of sand, which is that we think it's a storm layer which killed off these domes. Yeah. These domes were growing quite nicely for a probably long time. It grew quite a long, quite a lot of growth here. Suddenly there was a storm, a massive storm that deposited a foot or two of sediment over the top and drowned a whole lot of them. These stromatolites have been in existence uh, on the earth probably almost three billion years ago. So these are only quite, these are only um, 650 million, million years old. But you can get them today in Shark Bay, Australia. They exist in the hypersaline lagoons that, where the gastropods don't like them, don't like to eat them. But these are similar. So nothing has changed, really. Uh, the present is the key to the past here. Uh, these shark based stromatolites are very similar to the ones we see on Isla uh, 700 million years ago. Just to mention another whiskey connection here, um, the, 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 the Bunnerhaven dolomite is, uh, has a spring on it, and Bunnerhaven distillery take water from this spring and uh, use it to make whiskey. And you can see from my chemical analysis here, we've had a look at this, this water here. It's quite high in magnesium and it's quite a high pH, and it's one of the few distilleries on Isla that doesn't have soft water, it has hard water. Um, arguably it makes, uh, a slightly different whiskey. Um, uh, there is a lot of thought as to how much this hardness changes the fermentation process. So it's not about distillation and chemicals coming through the distillation because your carbonates are insoluble. They're not going to come through the distill, through the still, but they might affect and they will affect the, the, the fermentation. In fact, soft water is liked for whiskey fermentation because it makes a faster fermentation this is slower and can produce some, some higher alcohols and some higher uh, a load of esters as well. So, um, you know, water is important to, uh, to the whiskey industry and it, getting it right is what you do. Um, but yeah, but Isla, um, Bunnerhaven is slightly different to the rest of them because of its hardness of water, because it comes off this dolomite where the stromatolites are. Yeah. 
I'm going to take you down to the south of Isla. Um, still, yeah, we're doing all right for time. Yeah. Um, there's three distilleries down here as well. Uh, this is uh, this is Lafroig, this is Lagavulin, this is Ardbeg. And the geology of the south coast of Isla is dominated by these green stripes here. And these are uh, igneous, meta-igneous rocks. They were intruded as uh, as uh, horizontal sheets of rock in the developing part of the of what became the Yapatas Ocean. This rift that Rodinia created in Rodinia turned into an ocean eventually called the Yapatas. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. And these uh, ridges of rock are uh, prominent in the Southern Isla. And um, a lot of the original distilleries were hidden in the ridges. And I'll show you some pictures of these uh, ridges in a second. Next picture. Yes, here's one. So this is, this is the igneous rocks in the, in here on the left-hand side. And there's a ridge of igneous rocks over here with a low ground between where these softer sed meta sediments are. This is sort of meta mudstones and slates, things in here which erode out more than these hard igneous rocks forming the, 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 the intrusions. And the distilleries in the past, the illegal ones, were all located in here. This was probably a lot more wooded and you could hide a distillery uh, away from the taxman in, in, these little island, in these little places here. And that's why there's still a lot of distilleries there. They, want, they were the three or four that became legal, uh, whereas all the rest obviously disappeared. Um, it's also thought that some of these early distilleries, instead of using peat for, for firing the, uh, the malt and heating the malt, which we do now, which gives the Isla its whiskey, uh, its prominent uh, pronounced uh, uh, peat taste, a lot of these early distilleries, these illegal ones, used charcoal because uh, it didn't produce as much smoke and uh, you could hide away your charcoal distillery in the woods and make whiskey till the cows came home. These are the sills. These are the igneous rocks here. This is meta-igneous rock here and it's been quite altered at the bottom here. These are the meta-sediments here that it's intruded into and there's been a lot of work that some of my other researchers on Isla are doing just to understand the chemistry of these and how much carbon dioxide is created in the mountain building process that contributes to the carbon cycle. So another sort of another study that's all about earth climate and earth history and how, how geology and climate are int intimately related. And uh, yes, it's a sort of a, it's an interesting uh, study area. Um, just, a, just a final sort of bit on, on, on this area. This is a, a long strike from Port Ellen, uh, up near a place called Aros Bay. Um, this is uh, Kildalton Cross, um, which is made out of, it's an 8th century, a beautiful 8th century cross, really well preserved. Um, and it's made out of this same rock in these sills. These, uh, in the literature you'll call it, it's called epidiorite. It's a term that's not used anymore. It's a metabasite or a metadolorite. It's a basaltic rock that's been metamorphosed. It's quite green and fine grained here and uh, makes, it's often used, all of these Celtic crosses and things across the whole of our guile. Are, um, are made from this uh, igneous rock, uh, the, uh, the so-called epidiorite or the metabasite. Uh, this is a particularly fine example. Um, I mentioned that these ridges and these bay and these glens between them are, are quite prominent. There's a bay that is formed here in the soft rocks here called uh, Glasuig. This is Glasuig. Um, and this was one of the few places that German U-boats in World War I used to anchor, get fresh water and rustle sheep. Um, the, the local farmers used to sort of spot Germans, uh, so German sailors stealing their sheep and disappearing off in the U-boats. Uh, so yes, it's a, this is known this is known locally as U-boat Bay. And these uh, these um, igneous rocks were formed like this. They were formed by m molten magma rising up as a new ocean is created. A new ocean is ba basically is created. Basalt rises up. In dikes, these are vertical dikes like this one. This is on the south coast near Lagavulin. Um, it rises up and it reaches a sort of hydrostatic pressure level where it can't rise anymore. This is the sea here. And it spreads out into these sills. Then more sediment is piled on top. Another phase of dike intrusion happens, not a pulse. And it rises up, get, can't get any further and spreads out. And we, that's why we get this pattern that you saw in the original geological map of sills because they've all been tipped up. They're now, they're now actually all rotated about 30 or 40 degrees in this sort of orientation. So that's how they, they all stick up now that, uh, because of the folding that's happened. But uh, yeah, these were, these were intrusions during sedimentation. It's quite a nice story. Um, and a, and a, the seawater has reacted with some of these sills and there's some very good sort of interesting chemistry going on in the sills at the time of intrusion. 
by 550 million years ago, at the end, the, the, the Dalradian was been deposited on the edge of the, the continent and Rodinia was no more. Uh, I'm not going to start singing a Proclaimer song, but nevertheless, uh, Rodinia no more. It's broken up into pieces. It, it doesn't exist anymore. And the continents are going to split apart and eventually they're going to perform Gondwana land and Pangaea and form the next cycle of supercontinents. But at, at 500 million years ago, the beginning of the Cambrian, these continents are moving apart and creating lots of continental shelf. And this creation of these massive amounts of continental shelf from a continent that was splitting up is part of the reason why we get the explosion of life in the Cambrian, because we've got a lot of, sort of continental shelf. Some of it are quite low latitudes and warm waters, shallow waters, plenty of places for life to evolve into. And the Aptos Ocean is opening and England was forming over here. Uh, the earliest, oldest rocks in England are about England and Wales, southern Wales in Wales and southern Ireland are about 600 million years old. Um, so at the time, most of Scotland had formed by then, but England hadn't. Um, and England was a long way away on another, on another continent at the time. They were 3,000 miles apart. Now, eventually, I'm not going to go into the story today, but the, the Iapetus Ocean, like the Pacific Ocean, was at once a, an expanding ocean. It's now a closing ocean. The Iapetus Ocean eventually closed at 400 million years old ago. And England collided into Scotland, and it, and it joined up with Scotland uh, at around about the same uh, as the political boundary today. So the Southern Uplands line, uh, the southern part of the Southern Uplands is the boundary to England and Scotland as it is geologically. Yes, that collision formed the Caledonian Mountain. So 470 million years ago, those of you know your geological time periods, that's Ordovician. In the Ordovician period, uh, it was when Scotland had mountains as high as Everest, which is Everest. And this is uh, perhaps a Jura about the size of Everest. It's a nice uh, faked story, fake picture, but nevertheless, it sort of shows the scale of the mountains. They were big mountains. This collision that happened and, uh, when the Apatis closed uh, caused a large mountain belt to form, which has now been eroded away. And what we see today are the stumps of these mountains here. These are the folds I showed you in the first picture. So the, the, crump, the, the collision caused crumpling of the rocks, folding of the rocks. You can see these rocks are sort of bent, bent and folded. This is at Sarago Bay. There's a lovely fold here in the rocks here. So this is uh, folding wasn't too dramatic on either. It was uh, it was quite uh, further as you come near the collision zone to sort of uh, Loch Lomond area. You get a lot more deformation, a lot more tighter folding. But the, these folds were like gentle rocks in the carpet here. They were quite gentle. Just to sort of move on geologically um, from the Ordovician right up to the tertiary. This is, this is 50 or 60 million years ago on the north coast of Ireland. We get these thing, these dikes. Remember I showed you some dikes earlier. These are vertical sheets of igneous rock intruded into the sedimentary rock. So the sedimentary rocks are, this is the bottom half of dolomite again. Um, and then you get these massive cracks forming and igneous rock, molten rock, forcing its way up into these into these cracks. Um, they're quite, on the north coast of Islay, they're, uh, they're uh, beautiful sort of a very stunning sort of feature of the, of the north coast because they obviously erode less than the the dolomitic rocks the Dol dolomitic rocks uh, are surrounding them and this all happened at about the time of the meteorite collision at the end of the uh, at, the, at the end of the cretaceous so um, around about 60 odd 65 million years ago um, there was a, a huge amount of volcanism going on in scotland uh, in a lot of, a lot of it in fissures and a lot of these fissures are now occupied by dikes which trend this way. And the dikes I've just shown you trended this way across, uh, across Isla, across Jura, across there. And they, they, a lot of the dikes radiate out from volcanic centers that were uh, accentuated in Sky, uh, Ardna Merkin, uh, Mull, um, and the Antrim Plateau has, has also a lot of lava as well. And these dikes, the ones we see on Isla, probably come from a submerged volcano underneath the, the um, I've forgotten its name, the uh, Blackstones Bank uh, offshore, just been out by the Skerryvore Lighthouse. There's a submerged volcanic complex. It's probably like a submerged version of Sky, but it's underwater. And uh, there was a big volcano complex here, and these dikes were coming out. And this is all part of the opening of the North Atlantic. Uh, here's a map of the North Atlantic. Um, so the UK continental shelf goes right out past uh, Rockall, Hatton Bank. And if you get to this point, 
all this is oceanic crust, new oceanic crust that's formed in the last 50 million years. And this is zero. This is new crust forming right down the middle of Iceland. And you can age date this is zero, 10, 15, 20, 25, up to about 50 million years. So this is a new, quite a new ocean basin formed uh, 50 million years ago. We were right next to Greenland. Yeah. Well, the edge of the continental shelf was. Um, so it, the continent now, we keep thinking it's here, but it's actually way out here. Um, here. This was the bit that was joined into Greenland 50, 50 on 60 million years ago. How are we doing for time? Um, yeah, just about to finish. Uh, at the very end, uh, at the very end of uh, geological time, we are now in the current ice age. But twenty five thousand years ago, Isla was covered in ice. Scotland was covered in ice. The British Irish ice sheet was contiguous with the the Scandinavian ice sheet. It covered quite across the North Channel, Northern Ireland, Middle Ireland was all covered in ice, and most of the debris from Scotland is actually out here. All the erosion products of this ice sheet are actually stuck out here in these big fans of rock, deep in, deep on the edge of the off the edges of the continental shelf. On Isla, they're evidenced by, I saw you showed you the caves, the, these are the raised beaches, there's actually a terrace above that with a second beach. Um, so there's a complex geological um, deglaciation history on, on Isla that's, uh, that's, that's subject to many studies and it's a lot of good interest to geomorphologists on Isla. And, but Mullov Isla is, when it's not got some limestone on it, uh, a lot of Isla is covered in this stuff, which is glacial, this is modern till. You remember I showed you the the uh, 700 million year old till, a lot of isla is covered in this stuff, which is uh, difficult to, to grow on. And if you get a lot of this stuff, this till, it's uh, or boulder clay as it's called, it's, uh, it's a sort of a nightmare. But where it's where, where you get glacial outwash gravels, sander in, in sort of Iceland, you get these gravels and you get a lot of gravels on isla uh, and sands that were deposited by meltwater rivers flowing off the ice sheets. This is a channel, a gravel channel, these are sands. Holes that are sand martin nests. Um, it's a lovely place to go and watch sand martins where they love the sand. They don't like the gravel so much, but they love the sand. Um, the beauty of these is that they're very good for growing barley. And Kilhoman Distillery have owned the land around the distillery now, and there's a lot of barley grown because this is good, well drained gravels. The tills and things are up on here, and it's rubbish up here on the hills with the bare rock and till. But down in here, where you get these glacial outwash gravels, and a bit of windblown sand and stuff mixed in with it. You get well-drained soils and grow good barley for whiskey around about Kilhoman. Another interesting thing at some of these tills, uh, this is a glacial marine till. It's actually been deposited by a snout of a glacier into the sea. that has got flints in it. And these are flints that were found in here. We think these flints have come down the glacial stream from Mull um, and they were picked up by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers after the ice, so 8,000 years ago, these rocks were, these deposits and the beach deposits that were formed by the erosion of these were very important to the, the hunter-gatherers of the first uh, after the ice uh, inhabitants of Isla 8,000 years ago in the Mesolithic. And there's a lot of Mesolithic study being done on Isla. In fact, we've, there has been found, these are 8,000 year old ones, but there has been found a, a sort of tundra hunting camp that's probably 11,000 years old um, on the east coast of Isla. So the sort of archaeology and the uh, of, of the sort of Mesolithic uh, into the Neolithic archaeology of Isla is really interesting, and flint was a key part of it because flint's rare in the in the Western Hebrides, and they would obviously, um, if, if if and when they found it, it became a an important resource um, for for the Mesolithic uh, hunter gatherers. So that's pretty much it. Um, as I say, I have written a book on it with uh, Roger and Alistair. Um, it covers these excursions. We've been up, we've seen most of the rocks on these excursions. I am in the process of writing volume two to cover some uh, nice excursions on Jura, three on Collinsy, and a few more on Isla to sort of complement it. So, uh, and I might rewrite and re re reissue uh, the first edition of this. Uh, this is a 2017 updated edition with its whiskey recommend. Each walk has a whiskey recommendation. Um, and that's where we are now. Uh, time for a dram. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. A fascinating talk. Uh, I think maybe if we, we've got a few questions that have come in already, um, but perhaps if we could maybe wait for five minutes to give people a chance to uh, put in any other questions they might have, give you a chance to have a dram and uh, wet your throat again. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, I'll I'll we'll start again in um, 8.30 and if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A tab, type your question into there 
Uh, and if there are other questions that you see already there that you're interested in, please upvote them uh, so that we can see what people are interested in. I'll, I'll mute myself again for a moment and back, back with you uh, in four minutes. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, okay. So um, we've got uh, several questions have come in. Um, so I'll read them out, and um, if, you, if you then uh, want to give us your answers for those, please. Okay. I've got I've got them on my screen. You probably don't need to read. Do you want you can read them if you like, but um, yeah. Um, but oh, read them okay. out. But I, I have them on my screen. That's great. If you'd like to read them, there's a couple that have come in through the chats rather than through the Q and A. But if, if you're happy to read them, then that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay, I'm just um, I'm just trying to think where I start. Okay, I'm just at the top of my list here. I've got uh, Isla Distillery is a spread across a very different rock types. Yeah, produce a whiskey with a relatively similar taste. Does it suggest that water chemistry has very little effect for the use of peat drying the grain? That is an interesting question. I mean, the peat drying the grain is the main reason for the. Uh, the peatiness of Isla whiskey. Obviously, some whiskies aren't peaty on Isla. Brookladdy uh, standard whiskey is not peated, neither is uh, Bunnahaven. So yes, the, whisk, the, the, the the peating and the barrels have a huge effect, more so than the water chemistry. But I think the water chemistry is interesting. And uh, um, yes, uh, it's, I mean, Ardbeg, for example, has quite a high humus content because the water sits in a muddy peaty lock for a long time before it gets into the distillery and there's a high humic content which you think probably gives a sweeter whiskey so there is mar changes at the margin i would say with the with the, with the geology in the whiskey and the the um yeah most of the isla water is what in the distilleries is from the uh, is basically rainwater um um, with a bit of peat in it, but the peat in the in the water does not give the water, the peat taste. It's the burning of the peat to fire and dry the malt that causes the phenols to come into the into the whiskey. Which phenols, being volatile chemicals, do transfer through the still process. Um, someone said the geology I ended up with the reason why there's so many distilleries. Well, there is a geology reason, as I mentioned about the illegal stills on the island, um, and they they maintain themselves there. Um, a lot of it's just, you know, since then there's just been more more distilleries because there's an infrastructure for it as well. And there's a new distillery, whether the, whether COVID-19 will change that, there's a new one planned for Port Ellen, near Port Ellen, and Port Ellen is going to open again. So there's, uh, and there's Ardner Ho is a brand new one as well. So there, there's, there, there's a piggybacking effect going on with uh, more and more. Uh, the question from Pat Monaghan, could you say anything about the fossil record? Well. Basically, the, the stromatolites are the main indication of life. Um, uh, and, and someone's mentioning here just below there about Martin Brazier, uh, unfortunately died recently, um, worm cast. It's not in the blobs along its length. It, he, um, he later rescinded that interpretation and believed it was, uh, it was more of a diagenetic or a chemical effect post-burial rather than a, than a worm cast. Although we did at the time write a paper um, uh, on it, saying it was one of the oldest fossils. But in the same formation, this is the Bonnerhav and Dolomite, where I mentioned where the stromatolites are, is where Martin found this uh, this cast uh, or alleged cast. And um, Ian Fairchild at Birmingham has done a lot of work on Isla um, in the carbonates and reckons that there are indications of microfossils of more small sort of planktonic type things that have been preserved in were preserved originally in glauconite, but now in mica in the after metamorphism in the same rocks that Martin found his worm cast. So um, yeah, there's, there's, there's possibility, there's, things, there's also some things called acrotarchs as well, um, which are not really diagnostic, but there certainly was life in these seas. It was primitive life, life not as we know it, dominated by algal stuff, but there would have been soft bodied things. We know later on after the ice age, we get into the Edicarian where we do get uh, around the world more sort of fossils. Um, but as I say on Isla, we've got this, minor indications of life um, and the major indication being the stromatolites yeah someone's uh, Trisha has said about limestone as a thin layer so it is quite thin in places um, certainly a lot of good 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 but in places that, that it's a combination of the fact that this where the limestone has got some some till on it you get a sort of a more lime lime in the in the glacial deposit so that the glacial deposits have a lot of have some fertility in it um, 
it certainly it grows good grass so it's quite good for the the cattle and the sheep and they're the ones that you know they do a lot of grazing on the limestone it's uh, it's very poor uh, grazing into the into the quartzites which have got a very thin uh, very poor acid soil um, so the limestone is good for grazing um, um, yeah uh, so I mean Isla it it has grown as you say over the years hundreds of years it has grown grains uh, and it, you know it's been you know, a, a, a relatively fertile I wouldn't say it's very fertile uh, but it's certainly compared with other parts of the Western Hebrides it certainly has fertility um, Felicity has asked about the political boundaries I've loved this I love this story um, it's been around the Yapetus suture, as it's called, the joining up of, 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 uh, of the collision of the closure of the Yapetus Ocean does form the boundary. I mean, the southern uplands are the trench deposits that were in the oceanic trench that fought, that was in the subduction zone that existed between England and Scotland. And uh, England came up and collided with it um, and pushed up and, and folded all the, the, uh, the, uh, the rocks of the, uh, of the trench which is the southern uplands and uh, yeah, the Lake District and things with volcanic arcs way away across the ocean at one stage and they joined up. So um, yeah, Scandinavia, I think there are, ex there are the Yapetus suture is not just, is not just an English, Scottish thing. It occurs right across the, uh, into the, uh, into the, the Caledonides as they're called in, in northern Scandinavia and right across into the Appalachians as well. So it's a big orogenic belt that occurred at that time as this, as this big ocean uh, called Yapetus uh, closed, enclosed in a complicated way. Um, fantastic examples of the Yapetus suture in uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, if you're ever over that part of the world. Still an ice age, I think we are. Uh, if you define ice, most of the time in the Earth's history, it has not had ice. Ice is unusual, yeah? We have some ice ages in the Precambrian that we've just looked at. Uh, there's a bit of an ice age in the, or certainly in the Southern Hemisphere ice age in the Carboniferous. And there's an ice age in the, called the uh, late Pale the mid Paleozoic ice house in the Ordovician. Uh, 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 that's about it. Um, so yes. Um, um, so yes, we are, we have ice at the poles. Um, so we're in an ice age technically, and it could, just because we don't have ice here today at low levels doesn't mean it won't come back again. Um, so yeah, I think geologically we're still in the ice age. Yeah. Uh, someone's asked about interesting fossils. I think I've covered the fossil, the fossil discussion about the stromato stromatolites. Um, is there a choice of proximity for Gladi due to the geology or the whiskey? My choice. Okay, good one. Anywhere on island is proximal to a distillery. In fact, I can see three from my house. It's just a coincidence. It was just a nice, Saw the site on the internet, went over on my bike and uh, rang up my wife and said, I like this place, it's by this field, and we did. And it just happens to be just up the hill from Brooklady and uh, next door to the head distiller. He lives next door, so. Where are we with respect to the formation of a new supercon? That's a group one. I mean, the Pacific Ocean will close, but the Atlantic Ocean will open and then it will close. So I think some reconstruction has been done and the sort of cyclicity, if you keep moving these things around, eventually they come together and they split apart. It's just a sort of almost a super cycle, really. And a couple hundred million years, if you were still around, um, yeah, we might have got a, there have been, and people have done some work on reconstructions of what would happen if you carry on with plate tectonics into the future. Where, where is it all going to end up? Yes. Someone's asked the nice rocks in the volcanic arc are rarely, rarely seen in Scotland. That's true. They, uh, we, we have the only pretty much, there was a, I say we've got the patch on Isla. There's a tiny patch on Collinsey. There's a little patch off Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, this, the, there's a whole group of rocks in Norway called the Trans-Scandinavian Ignis Belt and also the Fecofenian Belt. So there are lots of rocks of this age in, uh, in, the, in the Baltic area and also obviously in southern uh, Greenland where they're beautifully exposed and it's all part of the same arc. So I think, uh, yeah, so the whole of the, the arc system that existed on the, on the southern, southern, probably the southern flank, it's probably difficult to relate modern to 
paleo latitudes and things and directions. But yes, on the flank of this Nuna Columbia supercontinent, there was a large volcanic arc. Like we get around the Pacific today, you get the volcanic arc all the way from uh, Kamchatka around right through the Southern Pacific. It's all part of the same arc complex, which is sort of on the edge of the Pacific, uh, edge of the Asian plate. So um, yeah, it's a sort of, uh, there's lo lots of similarities there. Two crosses on Isla. Yeah, there's actually quite a few, uh, but but Kildalton is the uh, is the, is the key one. If you're interested in Celtic crosses, it's a good one. There's there's other there's other ones up at Kilnave on the north side, and there are. If you want to get into this, uh, there's a lot of publications on the archaeology and early history of Isla. Um, David uh, Caldwell from the National Museum Service is is your expert on this. He's written some really good books. On, on the on on that part of the on on the sort of uh, medieval to uh, recent history of Isla, there's a, he's got a gazetteer and a thing called um, Lord of Land, Lord, Land of the Lordship, um, and yeah, if you're really interested in in Isla archaeology and early history, there's stuff there. And if you're interested in the Mesolithic, Stephen Nyson has written some fantastic books, and is and if you look at Isla Heritage, um, you've got a lot of information there on Isla Heritage's website about. Uh, and then Finlagen as well, that David's very, very much uh, involved in. Dinosaurs, everyone asks dinosaur questions. No, but, but, um, I meant uh, some of the slides I took out of the lecture, realizing I was going on for ages. I did take them out just before I left, before I started. Um, we've got ammonites uh, offshore Port Charlotte, as you, that have been picked up by dredge, scallop dredges. So we believe there are dinosaur age rocks, i.e. Jurassic rocks, um, offshore in the, uh, around Isla. Um, a lot of the, the sea around Isla is actually forming, is formed on an ocean, on, on um, subsiding basins of younger rocks. So the reason why the islands are there is that because it's the harder rocks sticking up and the softer rocks from the Jurassic and the Triassic are in the basins, and you go, you can go on soft Triassic Jurassic rocks from Isla uh, right across to Northern Ireland. Um, and there are um, ammonites often because they're a common fossil. I guess if you dredged enough, you might find a dinosaur bone. But but and they probably would have walked around on Isla. And we reckon that the Isla would have been a a desert, and then a shallow sea may have covered it. Um, round Loch Endow certainly was a a sort of a swampy pond 250 million years ago yep just that we, the rocks are not exposed whereas they are slightly further north onto onto sky um uh yeah so we do get uh you do get some fossils there um the erosion 700 million years drew down the co2 yeah that's interesting silicate weathering um there's a lot of Silicate weathering of a turning of clay and then the, the formation of carbonates in the sea um, from the carbon, from the car calcium and the mesodium that have come down off the mountains. So the, the whole process of weathering, the weathering cycle, if it's very intense, will draw down CO2 and sequester it into limestones. So it eventually ends up in the limestones in the sea. Um, so if you get that sort of process, a lot of weathering going on, a lot of clay, clays being formed from feldspars, you will end up with a, a lot less CO2 in the atmosphere because it's then absorbed into and sequestered into limestone. Um, I've done the dinosaur one. What's going on with the small sets of rocks in the coastal part of Kildalton area? These are the di These are the sills. Remember I was saying about the sills that form the high ground? Um, so these protruding lines of rocks come out of the distillery. They are these uh, igneous or meta-igneous rocks, the sills that were formed uh, of igneous basaltic rock that was the precursor to the formation of oceanic crust in the Apathis Ocean. So these protruding lines of rocks, they, they circle and enclose sort of Port Ellen Bay, they're a nightmare for the Calmac ferry captains to get in to Port Ellen because of these uh, skerries that are these uh, submerged lines of, of the hard rock that, uh, that, form these, uh, that are formed from these sills or these in, uh, igneous intrusions. And they're, they're, they're all around uh, all around that south coast, it's around our bay, the Froy, the Lagavulin, the bay. Lagavulin Bay is formed from the soft rocks, whereas the, the edges of the, 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 the promontories on the edge of the bay that form the, the mouth of the bay are the hard rocks 
that once held uh, Duns and uh, Dunibay Castle is still there um, as a prominent thing on the hard rock. So the geology really does affect the, uh, the topography and affects the way that humans have used the topography to, to build and live on. Isla Silver, yes, but gold, no, we haven't got any gold on that. Not that we know of. Um, yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice if we was, but I think silvers, silver and some zinc uh, and, uh, are associated with the, with the lead. Um, there's some salarite and some calcopyrite, uh, copper mineralization, <coughs> but no gold. The question would be nice. Are there not so many layers of dull radium rocks to pause in Norway? Yes, I, I, yes, I think they're, they're underneath the Dalradian equivalents in Norway, there's more nice than, yes, you see deeper into the, into the sort of core of the Caledonian mountains. There are, there is, remember a lot of the nice in Scotland, we do a lot of nice, we do get a lot of nice in Scotland. It's Louisian nice, which is two and a half to three billion years old. So the whole north of the Great Glen Fault, the basement rocks there are the Louisian, which is older than the Rins, right? So the Rins is... 1.8 billion, and we do get some of that in, in parts of uh, Norway. Um, but uh, a lot of the northern part of, uh, of Scotland is, it, the, the nice is older, again, than the Rins. The Rins is slightly younger. Originally, when you look at the maps that the, those, the, the, those wonderful old Victorian Edwardian geologists sort of uh, discovered, they all, the, the pink rocks, they all thought it was uh, until 1988, it was always thought that the Rins was Louisian. It was always thought to be the same age as the Louisian. And it was just because it's pink and nisos, it just looked the same. And why wouldn't you? It wasn't until modern uh, radiometric dating using uranium and lead in, in zirconium and uh, in, in zircon minerals that in the 1980s, uh, early 90s, that we actually realized that the Rins was significantly younger than the Louisian. Still old, still very old, but certainly younger than the Louisian. You have liquid gold in abundance. Why would you want the metallic stuff? Well, shouldn't you? It's not so indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this, David. Uh, that's a, a phenomenal talk. We've, we've not done uh, a virtual lecture before, and uh, this has gone really well. There's very many um, complimentary comments uh, in, in the chat here from people who've enjoyed the talk. Uh, it, I've, I've had a taste of Isla before from this whiskey. I've not, never um, had a taste of it through the rocks before. Um, and I, I found this absolutely fascinating, learned a lot from it, and certainly have to go and visit it now, I think. Um, so thank you very much for doing this. We would normally uh, give us a small token of our appreciation um, in, in the hall, but I'll, I'll ask uh, George to send something out to you, uh, just as a small token of our thanks. Thank you. To um, everyone in the audience, um, it looks like this is how we're going to be doing um, lectures, at least until the end of the year, I would imagine. Um, so if you have had any problems with this, anything that you think has worked well, anything you think could work better, please do let us know through the chat. Please do let us know. You can email uh, George at info at royalfield.org and uh, we will take on board any comments and try to ensure that things work as smoothly as this for the rest of our lecture series. On that, thank you very much.